Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Desiree Hensel, and I am here with one more of the uh, Next Gen NCLEX workshops uh, that we will be focusing on writing those standalone items. Uh, as a dental reminder, we're going to ask you to place your questions in the chat for the moderated chat. We have it up and uh, going. Sonia is going to help me with it. But if it's been a really long time and you haven't been answered, uh, if we're a small enough group, you can unmute yourself and just pipe in. Um, until then, please do make sure that your audio is muted. To get CE evaluations, you're going to have to uh, follow the instructions that's going to be sent in the email uh, to register for that. The PowerPoints are going to be uh, posted on the Maryland uh, Nursing Workforce Center website um, following the event. If you attended last week and you're looking for the answers, uh, Sonia is planning on uh, posting those in the very near future. So watch for those in, in um, sometime next week. So this is how to write standalone items, bow ties, and trends. And the disclosures. Um, the typical ones that you always see. This educational event has no relevant financial relationship um, with ineligible companies, and none of the planners or speakers for this educational activity have relevant financial relationship to disclose with ineligible companies, those primary business who is producing, marketing, selling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. And the University of Maryland School of Nursing is accredited with distinction as a provider of nursing continuing edu education development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center, the ANCC, Commission on Accreditation. You're going to get 1.5 contact hours for attending this activity, but to get that CE, you have to complete the evaluation that's going to be sent to you by email and um, complete the acknowledgement section at the top of the evaluation. You're going to receive the CE certificate via email from the University of Maryland School of Nursing within two to four weeks after submitting the completed evaluation. So this is about me. Um, I am currently working as uh, the head of Hensel Nursing Education Consulting, but my background is I am the former dean of Curry College School of Nursing in Milton, Massachusetts, and I was faculty at Indiana University in, in Indiana. Um, I'm a maternal child nurse, so please bear with me if the questions seem a little bitly overly focused on OBPs kind of things. Um, I'm a certified nurse educator and certified healthcare simulation educator. I do research on nursing education, and I have the great pleasure to be the co-editor of Lippincott Q&A uh, 13E with Diane Billings. My contact information is here if anybody has any follow-up questions or anything I can do to help you. Our learning objectives for this session are that you're going to be able to write a bow tie and a trend item. So after uh, engaging in this session, you're going to be able to determine a topic for a bow tie and trend question, and you're going to write a bow tie or trend question for your own exam. Now, you should have access to some handouts from that were sent to you in an email. We are not going to break apart in breakout rooms this time because we kind of have learned our lesson that when we go into breakout rooms, it seems like it takes us a whole lot of time to get in the rooms and then we don't have as much time for the activity. So please do pull up those handouts if you've not already done them. But what we're going to do today is we're going to try to work through them together at the end of the session by putting information in the chat and sharing with each other versus going into those breakout rooms. So um, you should have uh, received that email with those handouts. And I hope you've had an opportunity to read the article by Betts. If you've not read this article, it's really a um, very important one to help you to understand the format for writing questions. Um, and also you, the standalone item newsletter. Um, that came out this spring was one of the most um, important pieces of information you can have to learn to write those trend and bow tie questions. I know you've seen this before, and I just feel like every time we talk about NGN, we do have to go back to that clinical judgment measurement model and what we are uh, doing. Um, remember, it was designed to test clinical judgment and decision making in large scale, high stakes setting 
and it's supporting NGN item development. Specifically, these items develop around this layer three, the recognizing cues, analyzing cues, prioritize the hypothesis, generate solutions, take actions, and evaluate outcome. This model can be adapted for teaching, um, but the focus what we're working on is talking about using it to develop item types. When we look at the basic background of this whole clinical judgment model, and are we measuring the right things? One of the things that's most important that came out of this is we don't want nurses that are entering practice because they can guess their way through tests. So the new item types really are um, designed in a way that makes it more challenging to be able to pass a test if you're just guessing. If you've joined my last two sessions, you've already seen this slide, but I don't think it hurts to review it again, especially if some of you are joining me for the first time. We know what the RN and the PN test plan is basically going to look like. Um, and this was announced at the NCLEX converse, uh, conference at the end of September. The one thing that is different is the RN and the PN test plan used to be a different item length and different um, time lengths. And that will no longer be the case when we implement the new test plan in, in anticipated for April of 2023. It will be remain a computer length uh, adaptive exam with variable test length, but the minimum number of items is going to be 85. The maximum number will be 150. Within that first 85 items, there will be 15 unscored items. Those are the pretest items that they are gathering all those statistics on. Those unscored items can be a mix of standalone items and case studies. But if someone gets a case study in that, they'll get all six questions associated with them. The first 70 graded questions, so not including those 15 unscored, are going to include three six item NGN cases. So that's 18 questions that are going to be in a case. And when the exam is in a case, it does not adapt. You're going to enter the case and you'll get all six questions associated with it. And then at the end of the case, the adapting begins where you either are going to get harder questions or easier questions or stay on the same pace. In that first 70, there are 52 standalone items. Now, we're going to go into more what standalone item means here. Um, a standalone item, and this is a new way that was kind of defined when we went to this NCLEX conference this September. A standalone item means it's not in a case. So 90% of standalone items that occur after the first 65 items, so um, the uh, additional 65 items, meaning after that minimum score test, about 90% are going to be the things that we're used to seeing that test client needs. So the current item formats is probably the best way to think about that. But then there will be about 10% that are going to be a new item format that are the trends and bow ties that are specifically there to test clinical judgment. These standalone NGN types can appear in that first 85 questions, but we know for a fact after that first, if they if the minimum test is not um, the test that the student takes, if they take a longer than minimum test, we know that approximately 10% of all future questions will be the standalone trend or bow tie items. The test is going to be five hours. We think cases are going to take about 15 minutes. We know that students in a five hour exam, the maximum length 150 minutes, they get about two items, two minutes per question, and that should be plenty of time for them uh, to complete the exam. So beta testing is supposed to start in 2022 with um, people, with some students having the ability to take the uh, new item types. We know that's what's going to have to come out too is right now there is a tutorial that students do before they take the exam. The tutorial is going to have to get updated. All the things are going to have to be in place and the new detailed test plan will get published. Okay, so standalone items. This is what we got from the NCLEX conference. Right now, we know that um, we have are still going to have in the exam some traditional items, the multiple choice, select all that apply, 
ordered response, fill in the blank, graphic and exhibit. These are all anticipated to continue into the um, uh, next exam. These are considered standalone types. They are considered standalone types that measure client needs. What will be new is what I own the far side are the clinical judgment standalones, which are the bow tie and trends. And these items are specifically meant to test clinical judgment. Now in the middle, I've got all the item types that we've talked about for the last two weeks, the extended multiple response, extended drop and drag, drop down matrix grid, high, and highlighting questions. These items can stand alone and specifically any of these items can be used to write a trend item. And we'll talk about that more as we go forward. So what's the difference between a case study and a standalone NGN type. So our cases has clinical information in an electronic medical record for one or more clients. And I tell you one or more clients, but um, for the most part, I've never seen an example from the National Council at this point in time that has more than one client. Um, and when you've asked them about that, they can't provide it. So I think this is coming down the road, but I don't know that it's here right this minute. It's a group of six items that represents the entire clinical judgment model. So all six steps. Um, the queuing lets them know that there's a case study screen number one, number two, number three. And it, so it lets them know where they are in the clinical judgment model. It requires that entry level nurse to make multiple clinical decisions throughout the spectrum of the mo uh, model. And these unfold. Now we know that these are only going to appear in the first 85 questions of NCLEX. And the reason being because the six questions have to hang together, but we know after 85, the computer could turn off at any time. Well, we can't turn off in the middle of the case. So we know that the cases are only going to be in the first 85 questions. After the first 85, uh, we still want to test clinical judgment, but we can do these with the standalone clinical judgment item types. These are single questions based on information presented in the EMR. It has a stated diagnosis or an implied diagnosis and includes uh, clinical information for a specific client and provides components that require the entry level nurse to make one or more clinical judgments. So we're not necessarily going to test every single phase of the clinical judgment model in these items. So let's talk about elements of style. And some of these elements of style, they, they can be used, they're just not specific to um, the standalone items. These are generally all of the NGN. We're going to use military time when we write our cases. It is okay to say TPR BP, BP or in my case, because I'm a baby nurse and we don't do pulse, we do heart rate. Uh, so you can do THRRR. BP are acceptable abbreviations in a table or text. They do ask that you spell out pulse oximetry versus saying SAO2 or SPO2. Um, temperature should be given in Celsius and Fahrenheit anytime you give a temperature. If you give a weight in pounds, you need to also add kilograms. It is acceptable to just say kilograms in this case. The term physician our healthcare provider are now both okay. If you remember uh, back in what they've been telling us all along in NCLEX, they wanted us to say healthcare provider. As we move to NGN, they're trying to be more realistic about what a, a nurse might see in practice. And so they have uh, decided that it is okay to use either term for the NGN items. It is also okay to use the term orders. And we know that when we were writing NCLEX questions up to this point, they wanted us to use the term prescriptions to mean things other than medications. In NGN, if they use the term prescription, it really is just gonna mean prescription, I mean medications. We'll use the term orders for other things. We are still only gonna use generic names for medicines. And one thing that you'll see as they format the questions is they like to use an arrow to show where the question actually starts or where that lead in starts because there is going to be other sentences there, but that's the, the particular um, cue 
to show where the item begins. So here is a bow tie example. So what we've got over here is we still have that introductory sentence, just like we did in a case study. Um, we've got, the, I've got the nurse reviews labs for our primary gravid client in the first, uh, at the first prenatal visit. And here I have at least one page of an EMR. Now, bow ties can have multiple pages, just like a case study. You have to have at least one page, or but you can have multiple. Um, we are going to set the NGN is going to be set up by um, uh, and by the National Council. So the bow tie would be on um, the 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 bow tie is on the right, the actual bow tie, but the case will be on the left, just like we would see if we were going to set up um, a case study. So here I've got. After reviewing the client's lab, the nurse prepares the plan of care for the priority concern. Complete the diagram from the list of choices below to specify what condition the client is most likely experiencing, two actions the nurse should take to address the condition, and two parameters the nurse should monitor to assess the client's progress. So what I can tell you is, these statements are always going to be the same. This part of the bow tie where I have start the arrow, you can just copy that because that is going to stay the same for now. Um, at When we, they first came out with bow ties, if you look to what they were saying um, at some of the previous conferences, they told you that these headings could be edited and what they were very clear about in at the National Council, um, at the NCLEX conference in September is yes, but at a future time. Right now, the only thing that has been tested are these terms that you are seeing. So it is very likely the bow tie can have different parts of the clinical judgment model in the future, but for this iteration of NCLEX, these are the only things you are going to see. Some things to notice is they are color coded so that the actions to take um, it's supposed to cue them to always go up to the green. The potential conditions are the same color as the middle, and the parameters to monitor are the same color. So it helps cue uh, students where they are supposed to put their items. There are always five options on the far side left, five options on the far side right, and four options in the middle. So breaking it down again, a bow tie addresses multiple clinical judgment steps in one item. They contain one or more EMR tabs on the left. And really what they are is they're a drop and drag with five targets. The item responses fall into three categories. The category condition most likely experiencing is the one in the middle and the well below says potential conditions. Actions to take are on the left, parameters to monitor are on the right. And we know in the future, there may be some different headers, but this is all that's gonna show up this time in NCLEX. You've got five options in the left, five options in the right, and four options in the middle. And when the students take NCLEX, they have to fill up all the spaces before they can go to the next question. Remember that there are five different writing uh, score, I mean, I'm sorry, three different scoring rules. And this one is going to be the zero one scoring rule. Every single blank is worth one point. And they get every blank um, correct, they get a point. So the maximum points are always five. Anything they get incorrect is just a zero. Um, the sum of all correct responses is the total amount for the item. Bow ties can have one or more EMR tabs. And what you're looking at are nurses' notes, history and physical, laboratory results, vital signs, admission note, intake and output, progress notes, medication, diagnostic results, and flow sheet. And flow sheet is a great one to choose if you want to put things together or may not cleanly uh, fall into other categories. Um, I know that I've used Flowsheet when I wanted to talk about growth charts. 
So let's take this down into a few more pieces. The middle item, the potential condition, is really one multiple choice question. That's basically what it is. The actions to take is one multiple response question with five options to being correct. The parameters to monitor is one multiple response question with five options to correct. Okay, that's really what it boils down to. It's really boiling down to a bow tie is three questions put into one. NCLEX will color code the sections. Your actions and parameters to monitor should align with the potential conditions. So the thing when you write these is you want to make sure that things are plausible. And just like when we write other questions, you know, does everything plausible? So you don't want to put something out in your options that just doesn't align with anything. So don't put narrow checks in um, as something to monitor if none of the conditions that you're putting in the middle um, have a neurologic connection. So think about this as writing this as a care plan. You know, bow ties, when I first started writing bow ties, I thought they were extremely challenging to write. And then I kind of got a method down and now I'm, I'm so much faster than I used to be. It would take me four hours to write one, but now I, now I can get it down. And one thing that I have found that really helps me is to have either a care plan book there or just have your book sitting beside you as you go through the different steps. Okay, the lead in is always going to say, complete the diagram by dragging from the choices below to specify what condition the client is most likely experiencing, two actions the nurse should take to address the condition, and two parameters the nurse should monitor to assess the client's progress. It's always going to say that. So here's another bow tie. This time I've got a nurse's note to the side and the nurse cares for a client admitted for a manic episode on his third day in the inpatient unit. I've got two different time points here. The client's been taking lithium and olazapine with good effect out of the room with limited participation in unit activity, appetite increased. Uh, then at uh, 1440, the client was observed sitting in the day room. Uh, it was supposed to, day room was supposed to say watching TV. Sorry about that. The UAP reported that she went to take the client's vital signs. The client was stiff. Uh, the client was unable to move arms and was unable to respond coherently to questions. Skin, hot and diaphoretic. Vital signs T100.24, uh, 39.1 Celsius. Heart rate 110. Respirations. 18 and blood pressure 136 over 90. Okay, so we're coming over here and we're gonna write this care plan. The nurse reviews the client's assessments, a data to prepare the plan of care. And now I've got my arrow showing my lead in um, and the bow tie statement. So here, what I've got is, um, I've got the potential conditions as anaphylaxis, meningitis, neural molecular, uh, leptic malignant syndrome and lithium toxicity. Um, actions to take, we've got give the antibiotic, apply a cooling blanket, administer epinephrine, start IV fluids, administer neuroleptic, and parameters to monitor, we put urine output, breath sounds, vital signs, deep tendon reflex, and intracranial pressure. So, here I have coded the things that are correct. And what you see is that the student selected one correct option uh, to apply the cooling blanket, but then selected an incorrect option to administer a neuroleptic. They got the uh, condition wrong. They selected lithium toxicity when it should have been neural uh, leptic malignant syndrome. And they did know to monitor vital signs, but then they picked intracranial pressure when urine output was the correct um, measure. So what I can see here is I had a five point question, but the student got one, two correct. So they would have gotten two points for this particular item. So this is my method for writing a bow tie, you know, it's going to start with writing an entry level case that requires the nurse to form a hypothesis. That's not that much different than what you're already doing to write the case. The next thing I do is I identify the one correct answer, okay, and put that in the middle box. Then I go and I pick two interventions that are important to take and I go put them in the box 
over to the left. And then I determined two conditions to evaluate and I put them to the right. So basically I do come up with the right answers first, but then the next thing I do is I go back and I look at the client's history and I think, is there some other condition? I come up with three other conditions that the nurse might think the client is experiencing either based on the history or the symptoms. So once I've determined what those three are, then for each one of those conditions, I write one intervention to pick and put it over in the left. And I write one parameter to monitor and I stick it in the right. And those should be uniquely different than things that you would do to treat the primary condition. And by doing it that way, then I make sure that every single um, condition or action is plausible. So that's my method of going through and um, trying to break down doing a bow tie. So here's how it would work. I would, here's another practice. I've got an admission note and this client is accompanied by her daughter who found her at home this morning, uh, disoriented, lying in a pool of urine and unable to get out of bed. Prior to today, the daughter reports that the mother was living independently, though her memory was starting to fade and she cried frequently since her spouse died six months ago. The client is incontinent of urine and oriented to person only. She answers questions by saying yes or no indiscriminately. She's very agitated and appears to be swatting at objects in the air. Vital signs T100.2 to Fahrenheit, 39 Celsius. Heart rate is 100. Respirations 20. Uh, 20, blood pressure 92 over 60, pulse oximetry is 98 in room air. And my lead in was the nurse cares for a 92 year old female admitted to the medical surgical unit from home with a urinary tract infection. So I've got the same things that I would have put before, you know, that the nurse reviews the client's admission data and begins the plan of care. Got that statement that we have seen now several times. And then I start to fill this in. So this client has delirium and it's based from the UTI. So I'll put my potential condition in first, the delirium. And you know, what we're basically going to do is give the antibiotics is the main thing, but the client might also need some antipsychotics if they're severely um, agitated. And we're going to know the client's getting better from the delirium when the attention and the level of consciousness change. So that's, and if there are psych nurses out there that have better, um, answers for this, please, 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 as you make these your own, feel free to modify this in, in any way that you want or you think makes the case for your, um, your needs. So the next thing I do is then I go in and I fill out the other aspects of it. So this could be dementia, it could be depression, it could be regular psychosis. I'm giving some other psychiatric um, uh, conditions. Um, and then for each one of these, I have different um, uh, um, condition, I have different um, treatments and different parameters to monitor that I've added in. Okay, so that's kind of the short and down of dirty of how I do a bow tie. Are there any questions before we move on? No? Okay. Okay, so let's go on. I've got one more practice. Let's see if we can do this one. Um, oh, and I I'm sorry, um, this is Sonia. There was one question, it says, is it mandatory to color code? So I'm telling you that is how NCLEX will do it. I am not telling you that your um, program may not have the ability to color code. So I don't think that that's critical, but NCLEX is going to do that to help guide the student to the right places. Thank you. Okay, I think the most important thing is to get the questions right. Um, so here is another example of uh, uh, a, a bow tie. This time I added uh, two um, pieces of information, two EMR sheets, um, and uh, I've got a, a caring for an 80 year old in the emergency department. Um, I've got my history over here and I've got vital signs, um, in a flow sheet this time. And remember, we talked about that you want to make the amount of information on a, a um, 
EMR to be reasonable. And if you're getting way too much information that's making it hard to read, you really want to break it apart into different pages. Um, so here I've, I've given um, another page. I've got the basic lead in here. And in this particular case, what we have is a client with diabetes, but has a toe ulcer and basically uh, has developing sepsis. And so um, my potential condition here is sepsis. And we know that when someone has sepsis, we definitely want to give them antibiotics and a fluid bolus. Um, and we know that levels of consciousness will tell us about perfusion and a serum lactate is another thing that we might monitor. When I added other potential conditions here that a nurse might think, um, we've added that it could be that the client's dehydrated, demented, maybe having a reaction to the medication um, along with it, and added um, options that kind of align with, the, with these um, things. So dehydrated, I added force PO fluids. Dimension, I put obtain a psych consult. Um, as far as metformin reaction, hold metformin. And so you can kind of get the idea of how we're trying to make sure that all the options really end up being plausible. Okay, so you don't have a system that can do bow ties. I, I, I will be shocked if many of you have systems that can do this right now. You know, how, how are you gonna get expose your students to it? Well, there are a couple workarounds. First of all, certainly these are things that you can do in the classroom as a classroom activity. So let's start there. But if you wanna test this way, you know, until testing products are, are working, you, what you're basically doing is you're writing three different drop and drag questions using the same case. Um, and that's how I would treat it. So the first question might look um, like this, you've got your case to the one side, and you're going to complete the sentence by dragging the best option from the word choices the client is most likely experiencing and have your four word choices. The second one is to address the condition, um, the nurse should do something and something. So your second one, the actions to take. And the third question um, basically is that you're going to monitor the output. So that is a workaround until testing products become available. But certainly um, feel free and make sure that you're doing some of these in classroom activities. Okay, so that is really the essence of a bow tie. And um, I think we ask if anybody has any questions, put them in um, anything else before we move on. Okay, well, we're going to know. I'm sorry, <laughs> my it's taken a while for it to stop muting. Okay, there's a question that says, I think this was related to the first set of questions. It says, since the bow tie counts as five points, would that mean that the person could receive fewer than 85 questions? Okay, so I, I'm going to go back to you and say, no, no. Okay, so no. Every question, thank you for asking that. I, I think I was heading the wrong path. No, right now in NGN, remember, all questions have different point values, but they are only considered one item. What the National Council is doing is they are taking the total points for the question in account to see how much of the question they get right. And it goes towards determining whether the student is gonna get a harder or easier question. But it does not mean that they will receive less questions. It's still only one item. Hope that answered that. Okay. Dr. Hensel, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I understand this. I understand this last statement. However, if when a when a nursing student takes one of these questions, in reality, it's actually different questions, but they have the same amount of time to to respond. How is the NCLEX taking this in consideration, or if if you know? Uh, I do know, and I do know that they did the pilot testing, and they have determined that questions are still just taking about two minutes a piece, even in the more complex format. So they feel that, you know, when they still did it, students are still averaging a minute to a minute and to two minutes to take these questions. So they determined that the five hour time frame is still going to be adequate. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let's go on to the trends. Okay, a trend is something that has different data points on it. Um, you're still going to set up your case um, like you did before with this introductory statement. The client has been admitted through the emergency department with alcohol withdrawal. Okay. Um, in this particular one, I set up a flow sheet, and I think I told you before, sometimes when you're wanting to mix different types of data together, that term flow sheet works out very nicely to do that. So I've put the vital signs at different time points across the top, and I've put a nurse's note down at the bottom with, with um, uh, statements that reflect the different time points. Um, so you have the EMR still on the left with the different time points, and then you have your question over on the right. Now, the disc uh, disclaimer right before we get started is standalone uh, trend items can be any NGN item type other than a bow tie. So the item types that we did last week and the week before, all those new, the, the, the 13 different item types that they're going to use in cases, okay, a trend can be any one of those. So uh, that's going to make this a little bit more challenging as you go to write them. It can or cannot, depending on how you want to uh, tackle the problem. So uh, here I've got, um, I've got my case over to the left. On my right, my question says, the nurse reviews the last four client assessments. And then I've got complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options. So if you remember from last time, this would be a drop down. Um, and a drop down can have a single statement in it, and that's all I've chosen here, or it can have up to five different drop downs um, to in in the question. But I'm going to keep it easy. I'm only going to do one here. When you do a drop down, like we learned last time, you have to have a minimum of three, a maximum of five options. So. I'm going to complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options. The first action the nurse should take is to, and remember the word select's going to show first until you click it and then it'll open up. And then I have my four options. Um, this is a drop down option, but if you really kind of look at it, you'll see that it looks a whole lot like a multiple choice question that uh, to, to complete the sentence. So, um, this it would be one example of a standalone um, trend item that is using a drop down question. So the trends, they address multiple steps of the clinical judgment model by having the student review the information over time. The EMR data will include multiple time points and um, they can feature any of the NGN item response types and the score is going to depend on what item type you pick. So just like we learned uh, before, there are three different scoring rules um, that's going to apply as you go forward and do the trends. The bow ties are always worth five points, but these are going to be depending on what you pick and how you do your question. The trend item types. So what we know are the new item types are the select all that apply, the select and are our grouping, the close, the rationale, extended drop and drag, the drop down, close, rationale or table, the matrix good, multiple response, multiple choice, or the highlighting text and table. So you can use any of those um, to write your, um, your question. You can have one EMR tab. Now, when you see this described in the, um, the, the newsletter, it says one EMR tab. So I'm going to take them at the word that this particular case is not supposed to have multiple EMR tabs. However, I do think you can uh, combine information on a page. And I have seen many examples from the National Council where that's exactly what they do. They combine different data on a page. So flow sheets, you can put the nurse's notes under the vital signs, the vital signs maybe in one place in the INO, labs under a progress note. Diagnostics, feel free to combine your labs and your x-rays or things like that or any other combination that you think you need to do. So you want to get the lead-in sentence correct. Remember that um, it's for matrix 
you're going to it's going to say for each finding or whatever click to specify if you have a multiple response matrix it's going to include that statement each category may have more than one x and then at the bottom it's also going to say that each column must have at least one response selected if it's a highlighting question it's going to say click to highlight if it's a drop down it's going to say complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options drag and drop is drag oh and i've got drag and drop twice but drag and drop from the word choices drag from the word choices to fill the blanks of the following sentence select uh, multiple responses select n it's select n number of findings and then multiple response select all that apply select the findings that and then it followed by select all that apply remember the writing rules for select n and select all that apply is there can be up to 10 options you have to have at least five but there can be up to 10. The scoring rule summary is the same as that we talked about last week. Um, the ones that are zero to one are the multiple choice, multiple response, drop down table, drop down close, drop and drag close, multiple choice um, matrix. The plus minus are the highlight text, highlight table, select all the ply, multiple response grouping, multiple response matrix, and then the rationales are the uh, rationale, drop and down and drop and drag rationale. Now, we started talking a little bit about this last week, and I'm going to take a minute here just to talk about this, about um, you have to select a scoring method that's going to make sense for your program. I know that programs are coming out that are, have more elaborate scoring methods, but remember, already you don't score like NCLEX because NCLEX does a computer adaptive question. And if the student gets the question right, they're going to get a harder question coming next time. And they're looking for the point that the student's only going to get 50% correct. You don't do that. You're looking for students to get a minimum score to pass. And so you're already on a different playing field. I know when I was still at Curry College, we had a conversation about this and we made a decision that within Canvas, which was the testing platform we were going to use, they there was the option to do partial scoring for questions. And we made the decision that that scoring system was what we were going to use for our, and everyone was going to get partial credit based on the scoring system that was there. And that, that was what we were going to use as we implemented. So you're going to have to talk about this and you're going to have to come up with a scoring rule that makes sense for your program. You don't want somebody going rogue and doing it a different way. You want to all be on the same page as you do this. What is not fair to your students is to continue to make questions more difficult and then have them still be, you have to get everything right to get any credit. So, um, you know, right now, many schools are, are doing the um, questions that are the uh, select all that apply, that you have to get them all right or you don't get any credit because that's the way the NCLEX do it. And that's fine, but if you're gonna add five more options, are you being fair to your students if you're not giving them partial credit? So you need to sit down as a group and you need to make these decisions about how you are going to score these questions. The other thing we probably um, didn't have a lot of time to talk about that I wanna talk about before we move on is people wanna know how am I gonna know are my questions reliable and valid? You know, and NCLEX has a whole different way of going about and getting a question, um, determining if they have valid questions. Um, they, they refer to their exam as not being reliable. They refer to it as legally defensible because when we're talking about this reliable test, we're talking about giving it over and over again and getting the same results. Well, nobody gets the same test again. So it's a different format. Um, what I'm going to recommend to everybody until we get better guidance is number one, remember the first way to come up with um, writing an exam is to start with a blueprint. You want to do that and you want to make sure that you are not over or under representing content as you create your exam. So that's step number one. Number two, if you are not doing peer review right now, you can no longer avoid it. You have got to have peer review for these questions. Um, and they're gonna help you find things that you never thought you would see before. So you absolutely have to have a peer review. And I can tell you NCLEX always starts with a peer review, that these go through a peer review process before they ever get to the students to do. 
if you can test pilot test it is ideal i understand this is very difficult to do but as much as you can it is great to do that then what you're going to do is what i would do is i would look at the score on items so the average score an item has and to be a representation of the difficulty of the item and then i would go through to make sure every option was used and if you have options that are not used they are non distractors i would revise them and if you ever have a non or a option that is not correct that is selected more often than the correct option i would say that is a question that needs to be revised and until we get better ideas of how to do it that is the way i would start okay so more trend items so here we have another trend item. This time I'm going to have a flow sheet and I've got the age, the weight. I'm making this um, a well child check and it's all the uh, growth parameters. I've got the nurse reviews the client's growth patterns, complete the sentence from the list of drop down options. And this time I've added two sentences. And because I've added two sentences, I have now testing two parts of the clinical judgment model. I'm testing um, that they determined that the toddler's weight is healthy. So that's really basically an, an, um, an analyzed cues kind of thing, because I've made a judgment about that. And then the most appropriate intervention is, is a taking action, or um, and we're going to continue uh, growth monitoring, um, or inter, um, intervention, I'm sorry, this is a, a generating solutions um, and three options. Now, I absolutely love drop downs for several reasons. And one of the reasons I love these drop down questions is I only have to have three responses when I do a drop down. Um, and everybody knows that writing a question with three responses answers is a whole lot easier than writing a question with four. Um, they you know, the, the drop downs have to have three to five, but again, you can only do three. So it's it, it's easier than, than struggling to figure out what that fourth option might be. You can be that single sentence, and I gave you an example of that, or you can be up to five sentences. And, it, and five sentences, boy, I could test five different phases of the clinical judgment model just by changing my sentences. Um, they are probably the easiest way you can convert a multiple choice question into a technology enhanced item is by turning it into a drop down. So those are reasons that I really like this particular format of a question. Okay. Here is another example of a trend item. And this time I have uh, taken my flow sheet with uh, different time points. And I've got my categories of colors, respirations, heart rate, and temperature. I'm doing some uh, neonatal assessments. And I'm assessing uh, nurse cares for a neonate at eight hours of age. The nurse reviews the client's assessment data. Which actions should the nurse take? Select all that apply. Well, here, I've just got a regular select all that apply question. Remember, um, I can have minimum of five options, maximum of five. And the way NCLEX is going to score them, it's worth as many points as you cue correct. And here, this one would have been worth five. I mean, worth three points. I could take that same question and turn it into a highlighting question and ask them to click to highlight the assessment findings that need immediate follow up. And if you remember the highlighting from last time, they are uh, tokenized, meaning that there are areas of text that the student hovers over it and it shows the students that they can select that. So here, I have just showed you what I've tokenized by putting numbers um, beside it to show that I have uh, tokenized four different areas of text, basically each, each line of the um, uh, um, chart here that, and to show what's options. And here, two of them would be uh, correct, sel correctly selected, they, uh, central cyanosis and the respiratory rate. You can also make this a trend. I've taken that same question and uh, the nurse reviews the client's assessment data. For each specimen, uh, each assessment finding, click to specify if the finding is anticipated or not anticipated. And that's another way of saying, is this a normal finding or not a normal finding? And um, 
this one, I said there's five points possible, but again, please, uh, please forgive me. I am a little bit dyslexic. There's only four rows, so there are only four points possible. Okay. And I can make a drag and drop question. The nurse um, here drag from the word choices to fill in the blanks. The client is most likely displaying symptoms of, and here it's congenital heart, in, um, evidenced by the color changes and the tachypnea without distress. Now, this one would be a rationale, um, it being drop and drag, because it's all one sentence. And the first part, knowledge of the second part, you have to have the first part right um, to understand the second part. Okay, so lots of different items that we could do. So let's take a minute here um, and look at our question. I've got a nurse cares for a college student in the emergency department with suspected substance abuse. And here I've got over the history. I'm gonna let you read this to yourself. And the nurse monitors the clients after administering two doses of naloxone. So basically this is a opioid overdose and we've given naloxone twice. So at 1035, I have my assessment. What questions might you ask for this trend? So maybe um, maybe what you could do is maybe unmute, just read, take a second to read, and maybe some people could chime in and tell me what they think that they might ask for this question. So I heard someone bravely unmuting. Anybody got some feedback of what they think might, might be a good uh, trend item? Um, Desiree, that was me. Someone wrote vital signs. Okay. And... So person who wrote vital signs, what can you, so what do you, what might you elaborate? Any ideas? We could say which vital signs are, which, which vital signs need immediate follow-up. That would work. A couple more people piping in the chat now. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know why they're not unmuting, but vital signs um, on the phone, I mean, on phone. Someone wrote, um, what action should, should the nurse take next? Oh, very good. Yeah, what action should the nurse take next? Perfect. Respiratory. Mm -hmm. um, that's it right now. Okay. Okay. Well, what I just put, this is what I put as an example as a possible answer. The nurse administers the client after uh, two doses of naloxone, which findings would indicate the client may be experiencing opiate withdrawal after naloxone, select all that apply. So this was uh, one that I came up with, but certainly what should the nurse do next would be a really, a really good um, uh, thing. You might want to put in uh, what, um, instead of telling them there uh, it might be experiencing opioid withdrawal, uh, what uh, you, this could be what condition may the client now be experiencing, could be um, uh, part of the uh, most likely experiencing, could be measuring uh, the third step of the clinical judgment model. So uh, there are a lot of things that you could uh, put in at this point in time. So questions that we have up to this point before we go and we do a little bit of practice. I did, when I, it's difficult for me to watch the chat. I know that Sonia is monitoring the chat and I did see someone put in something about accommodations. And I do wanna tell you that the National Council assures us that they will continue to honor accommodations in the way that they have still, have, that, that currently they do. When students apply for accommodations, if they've been getting accommodations all through their nursing program, they can apply for accommodations to take NCLEX and uh, the, then, regulatory body, their board of nursing will decide whether or not to grant the accommodations. They still plan on having extended time. They still plan at this point, they still plan on having readers. They still plan on showing um, different contrasts for the screen, private rooms, all those things they still anticipate may, being available to them. You know, the accommodation students cannot request now is a paper pencil test and that will continue. Okay. Anything else I should answer from the chat or questions I can answer? Um, they're just saying, got it. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, and ExamSoft is partnering with ATI. 
and it's and the, and it says that they can accommodate next gen. I and I know that they're all all major vendors are working on this right now. I, I think that one may be a little further along than some of them, um, but all major vendors are are working on it. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to pull up a worksheet for us to work on together. So let me pull this up. Uh, practice handout. Okay, so you should have gotten some practice handouts. So I'm going to encourage you, I've got my screen up, but I encourage you to pull out your handouts um, to work through these cases. So what I'm going to ask, again, since there's only 31 of us, um, I think it's, it'd be helpful if you want to say something, it's probably easier to go ahead and unmute than to try to put this in the chat um, as we work through this. But if, but if you if you want to put it in the chat, I'm not going to stop you from it. I just it might get answered sooner if you do it the other way. Okay, so I'm going to start with case one. And this is a newborn with congenital heart syndrome. Um, and I've told you that the has congenital heart syndrome. So that's the giveaway of what to put in the middle. I've got my vital signs uh, and uh, a couple different time points. Now I'm, we're gonna write this as a bow tie, but because I put different time points in, this question lends itself to also being a trend item. I'm gonna, um, so my, uh, at 1100, the color was acrocyanotic, the respirations were 72, breath sounds clear, no nasal flaring, retractions are grunting, heart rate's 128, no murmur, temperature is 98.9, which is 37.2 Celsius. Then 30 minutes later, I've got central cyanosis, the respiratory rate's 90, breath sounds are clear, uh, no nasal flaring, retractions are grunting, the heart rate is 138, no murmur, and the temp is 98.6, uh, 37. So, after reviewing the data, the nurse updates the plan of care. Complete the diagram from the choices below to specify what conditions the client is most likely experiencing, uh, two actions the nurse should take to address the condition, and two parameters the nurse should monitor. So um, I don't know how many uh, peds nurses I have with me or maternity nurses, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you the middle. And we already know this is congenital heart. and two actions the nurse might take is we're going to provide oxygen and we're going to obtain a heart ultrasound. Obtain, start that, heart. And we're that one right. And the parameters we're going to monitor is oxygen saturations. And we are going to do blood pressures. Okay, so what might we put in the middle? Sepsis. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Do I have an OBP nurse in my midst? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, that's that was on my list too. Any other? And it, so, so having said that, is sepsis in the middle? What's one action you might take then for sepsis? Fluids. Huh? Fluids. So, fluids. Administer yeah, yeah. fluids. Okay get cultures yeah chest x-ray okay well the reason i don't want to put chest x-ray and i'm going to tell you why because that yeah. would not be wrong for general congenital heart no right? exactly so exactly. you've got to be really careful that you don't <laughs> want to put something that's wrong right so, so lactate, serum lactate level okay obtain mm -hmm. do you want it that as a parameter to monitor or you want it as an action to take that's a good question. Um, monitor. Okay. Yeah, monitor. I would agree. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Some of this would depend on where you were too, because if you were like a postpartum nurse, you'd have to be calling for orders. 
Mm-hmm. Well, so so I want you to go back to mm-hmm. so so I want yeah. you to go back to the idea behind NCLEX. Remember, yes, all of these we all know we'd have to call for these orders. Okay. But but in NCLEX, the general rule is students, the options students have available to them, they're supposed to assume are available to them. Okay, and it yes. So um what I put in here, one of the other ones I thought might put is hypoglycemia. Mm. Yeah. It's going to be the next idea. Okay. Excuse me. And so I I threw in perform a gavage feeding. And that we would monitor blood glucose. Yeah. Ideas for the last thing we might throw in there. Dr. Hansel. Yes. Quick question. The actions to take and the parameters to monitor they need to be correct for the actual condition, but incorrect for the others? They uh, need to be incorrect for the actual condition. So as you set this up, typically what I would do is as you add conditions, these actions that I'm putting here are correct for the incorrect condition, but they are not correct for the correct condition. But you still have to include at least two correct ones, correct? Right. So here, the correct ones were uh, parameters to monitor were the oxygen saturations and the blood pressures. Whenever we have congenital heart in a baby, we would get blood pressures in all yeah. four extremities. All four extremities, yeah. And the, and then we this one the 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 baby needs some oxygen. Yeah. Um, and for the central cyanosis, and they would definitely get a heart ultrasound yeah. on this kid. Um, the others are not necess- are not going to necessarily be correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think when I set this up, um, I put administer antibiotics for the sepsis because that would yeah. be clearly wrong. So it could, yeah. it could be that too. Yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah. start them as soon as they did the cultures. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we'll put antibiotics. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I put for my fourth one, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, because a, a new nurse w- might look at um, yeah. the, uh, the breathing and see the rate is rapid but not mm-hmm. realize that mm-hmm. it's comfortable to kipnea mm-hmm. no. and i think then i put begin cpap for my action because that would be correct for that mm-hmm. um and then i think i had uh breast sounds that we're going to monitor breast sounds but we have a client that would not be um the breast sounds are clear so that would not be the correct answer so that's kind of how um i put that one together so thanks for having i'm so glad there were some obps nurses with me today that really helps if I wanted to turn this into a drop down into a trend item, because, you know, I have two time points, I could have made a trend item and I could have said the clients is at highest risk for, and I could have just put three of these options, the congenital heart being right. And we could have put our top three choices, sepsis and hypoglycemia, and we could have put it evidenced by, then we could go the, uh, some three parameters here, the, the heart rate, the cyanosis and um, the uh, um, breast sounds or something like that. Okay, well, let's move to one that might um, be more in line for some of our uh, other um, participants today. I think we did one on neuroleptic syndrome. So let's come down and let's do case three the young adult with a fracture who develops compartment syndrome. So this one hopefully will make uh, the med surge people a little more happy and uh, maybe some of the OBPs, the, uh, the, um, the pediatric nurses along the way. And if you remember, this is kind of building on one of the cases from last week. So maybe this will feel a little bit more familiar to you. So we know we've got a 19 year old admitted to the orthopedic unit following long cast placement for right tibial uh, fracture. I've got my nurse's notes at 
1615 uh, that the cast's intact, the toes are pink and warm to touch, the cap refills less than two seconds, pedal pluses plus one, states it hurts to wiggle the toes, rates pain seven of eight, uh, leg elevated above the heart, medicated with one milligram morphine, Swelling in right foot has increased, toes are pink, cap refills less than three seconds, pedal pulse plus one. Uh, 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 it's supposed to state he can't, it hurts to, uh, he can't wiggle his toes. Wiggle toes, rates pain, eight of 10, leg elevated above the heart. Okay, so you know the drill we're gonna come up with one condition in the middle and we actually know what that condition is we, that our client has compartment syndrome. So let's stick that one in there. Okay. So we know that that's compartment syndrome and we know we need to relieve um, the compression. And we could insert a pressure monitoring device. Or the surgeon's going to do that. And parameters to monitor. Anybody want to pipe in on a couple parameters to monitor? Pain level. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. Pedal pulse. Okay, pedal pulses. Huh? Oh. How are you going to get a pedal um, pulse if he's got a well, long leg cast? Well, he's already, we've got it up here. It must stop where the toes are. Yeah. The toes but, are uh, toes. Um, Not how about yeah. color and temperature? Yeah. Yeah, neurovascular assessment. Okay. The full neurovascular assessment. Yeah. The neurovascular checks. Okay. Okay, and that's sucks. neurovascular checks. Okay, so what can do we ask, want? Yeah, can I ask two questions? Sure. So, would one of the options of action to take would it be to call the physician or healthcare provider? Would that be what sure. you would do in this kind of situation? Okay. Sure, we can make and, that. And and the other one question I have is, since you have all the assessment data up in the top in the scenario. Do you continue that you're going to continue to monitor these? Is that what you're putting in there? Because you already have your assessment data at this point in time. Well, but you're not. This is so. Let me be clear. These are the these are the terms that are coming from the the um, National Council. They have said that it's parameters to monitor. So yes, it's continue to monitor. Okay. But this is how they're going to say it. So Thank yes. You. Okay. Um. Okay, so the one I want to say about calling the physician, the problem with putting that one in there is it's going to need to be wrong for anything else we put in the middle. So if we put other things in the middle that you would call the physician for, mm -hmm. then that's going to be a problem. So, so it could be a right answer, but it depends on what we put in the middle. And I'm going to go back to this pain in, in, and we'll watch how this goes. So what's another thing we might want to put in the middle here? DBT. Oh, yep. that was on my yep. list. Yep. Very good. Okay, so what would be uh, an action we would take for a DVT? Uh, a, a, some kind of a scanning. Elevate leg. Or elevate, yeah. Okay. Elevate leg, which is contraindicated in compartment syndrome. So that's right, good. very good, very good. Okay. Yeah. But in your example, the leg is already elevated. So that may be, so. So an action to take could be lay leg flat on the bed. Right. <laughs> But, that would, but that would be a correct action. So thanks for walking through this. Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want to put two things that are opposite each other. You don't want to put elevate leg, lay leg flat. So you pick one or the other. You either pick that you want them to do the correct response, but or 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 it, you know, but but you don't want things that automatically it has to be one or the other. Do you want to um, measure the leg uh, circumference? Okay. Now he's, DVT? he's still got a cast on. Yeah. Okay. But, but that's good, but I like, but you know what, but I, but I, but I like how you're thinking. I like how you're thinking. Okay. So administer heparin. Oh, 
Yeah. Okay, and an anticoagulant. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is perfect. And then what would we be monitoring? PT2. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, clotting studies. Yeah. Okay, so what's another thing it could be? I stuck in hypovolemic shock because of the circulatory issues. Oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. And that a, a new nurse might say, you know, he's not perfusing. And if I'm going to put in hypovolemic shock, well, um, hypovolemic, there we go. <laughs> Really, really rough when you're trying to do this on the fly. Um, so I put hypobolemic stop, and what I put as an incorrect one was administer a fluid bolus. Mm -hmm. Because if you already have compartment syndrome, that's going to make it worse. Yeah. How many potential conditions do we need to have? You got to have. You got to have four. So we're going to have to come up with one yeah. more. Would One's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you go way out there and say like a pulmonary emboli? Might they be thinking of fractures and fat emboli? Well, fat, fat emboli. emboli. Oh, you want a fat emboli? I think that's okay. a good one. Okay. I think that's good. I think I put sepsis, but I think fat emboli is better. So what would be the things that we might, uh, what would be, what would we monitor for a fat emboli then? What well, I mean, action to take for fat emboli. Um, apply oxygen. Minister oxygen. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or monitor oxygen saturation. That would be okay. And, uh, okay, so put it over here. Mm -hmm. Oxygen. Okay. Okay, and so it looks like I need, I've got clotting studies, neurovascular check, I need to have a parameter to monitor for the hypovolemic shock, and let's see what I said before. Uh, blood pressure. Urine output. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Yeah, blood pressure or urine output. Well, well actually, reason, you would monitor urine output with compartment syndrome to make sure yeah. you're not okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. True. And if, in fact, I think that's what I put. I put my things that I would monitor when I did this set it up as urine characteristics and neurovascular checks. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think, okay, so, so we have worked through this one together. So uh, it wasn't that painful, was it, to write this bow tie? <laughs> okay, so let's bring this back down. And as you can see, I have, again, once again, set this up, complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options. The client is at highest risk for so and we do want to be mindful that we don't always want to put the right answer first but i'm going to go in alphabetical order here mm -hmm. um so compartment syndrome and let's turn and option two so let's, right now you're showing us how to do a trend yeah, i'm showing you a trend Got it. And the option three, let's do the fat embolism because that was a really good one. Okay, bring that down. And it's evidenced by, and we could probably go back to the neurovascular checks. And then I have to come up with neurovascular checks and two other things that then would not be correct. Um, I can say ideas of what might be two other things that we could put here. Um, score. And we don't actually even have to have the second part. If you ever get in a bind, you can just get rid of it and just do the first part because we just need a drop down could just be one phase but i'm trying to make this two here so we could put by um is highest risk for um uh compartment syndrome evidenced by we 
Do we say neurovascular checks or do you actually include a symptom of how it's evidenced? Like is okay. that by well, swelling or? Th thank you for, um, for asking that question. You can do either. Now, one of the things that we noticed in the uh, National Council when they were setting up questions is in the beginning, when you saw early case studies and they would give you options, they were always restating what is over in the case, like they would say pain seven of eight, cap refill less than two seconds. And then as they've gotten a little bit more sophisticated, they've just said cap refill and expect the student to go back and read the case. Pain, expect them to go back and read the case because they feel when you're putting more uh, parameters in over here, you're, you're narrowing it down more for them. So, um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to think about this one for a minute and I may just want to just get rid of it and leave it here. Okay. So, we've done two bow ties here um and uh gone through a method for that. So I think what I'd like to do now is go back. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come back and let's find out what questions we have either about today's presentation or moving forward what kind of questions can i answer for everybody um i had a question the ch uh, the pain you said seven of eight or is shouldn't it be seven of ten sure if that's the scale you're going to use Oh, okay. Because I was just wondering, like, do you have to have the scale the same or can it be different? It can be whatever. Is, uh, the, the thing is, you just want it to be the same across your case, depending okay. on what institution you work in. If you're using a one to 10 scale, that might be what you're feeling. Just, just make sure it's clear in your case. Clear. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing is with the trend, how many um, times do you need do you need just uh, like a, you have to have a minimum two. Of you got to have two in and you and have to have a minute of two times you just have to show that there's been a change in patient over time can you have a max of like three or four or i have not seen them in say that there is okay. a maximum number but i can't say i've seen an example with more than four but i if you go back and you read the um the um newsletter, I don't remember them ever saying what the maximum number of time points is. I think it's going to come down to how crazy do you want to make yourself and how much real estate do you have as you're writing your question? How much space do you have to do it in? Okay, thank you. Can I ask you a question, just a general about uh, the next gen that's not specific to this content or should sure. I wait till we're over? No, please ask now. Okay. Maybe, but you've probably um, got others wanting to know the same thing. Okay, you're right. Um, so I've been harping on this for a while and we had a change in leadership and we are so way far behind. So any suggest we haven't done anything basically. So do you have any suggestions as to how to start this? Is this going to be something that a full-time person, I mean, everybody's so busy with all the chaos any way. Do you have any suggestions or maybe other schools how to just start this process? Because they put maybe a committee, but the only people that volunteered were people who've never wrote any questions before in their life. <laughs> okay, so I appreciate this. And maybe what we could do is get a couple people to pipe in how they're doing at their schools to give you some eye. I'll tell you how I did it at Curry. When I was the Dean of Curry, and I just stepped down in at the end of May because um, I couldn't do the commute anymore. Uh, um, since I actually live in Vermont and it was just getting too hard for me. But what we what we did is our, we came up with the implementation plan where we first focused on teaching. And I would say that you should spend the majority of your next semester because, you know, we're still a year away. I would focus most heavily on making sure that your um, faculty are writing cases and that students are practicing clinical judgment in class because it's not fair to test them on it if they've never seen it. I think it is fair to start with trying to do um, STEM standalone items and um, here and there to try to get them used to some new item types, but don't do it until you've come up with your scoring plan. I would make sure come fall that the students who are graduating are going to be getting at least a case 
study in every exam. That is how we decided that we we had a two year rollout, um, and we knew that our uh, we was we've been focusing on the teaching. But starting last fall, we knew our juniors would be the ones facing. Um, NGN. So we came up with the plan that all uh, junior exams were going to have one six point case studies, but you can start with the case study being just more familiar item types, not go into the fancy item types. They can be, and if you've been at one of my workshops before, you can do an entire case study just doing the multiple choice, multiple response questions. So you could do that six item case study to get them used to that before you add on the new item types. So focus first on getting the teaching part. If you haven't started anywhere, you're not gonna get the rollout for next semester, but focus on really hard on trying to get your rollout for your testing for next year. And, student, and, and start trying to figure out what item types you can and can't use. That would be my suggestion. Anybody did you, else? Did you say that they might, the group that would be, um, they would be getting some of the test items, but not counting. I know when it's supposed to roll out, but you said they're going to put some uh, for statistical purposes on they're, the exam way ahead of time. They're already doing that. I mean, okay. that's what this, that's what the special research section has right, been about. Right. Okay. But, but moving forward, there's always new questions being added to NCLEX as we have new content. So it's gotcha. the same process that's going on now okay. is going to continue. Okay, thank you. Hi, we, um, I just wanna make a comment. We used, um, we used case studies in our clinical simulations. You made a comment about it's really hard time-wise pilot test or practice test. But I think one of the things you could do is maybe even if you're flipping the classroom to prepare them, because we usually flip it a little and make them prepare for sim, you could give them um, like three of these type bow tie questions, you know, um, and then um, that they can come with so that when they go through the sim and we do the case study and then when we debrief, then we can um, see how they answered those as sort of like a pilot to see how they're doing. I think Great. that's absolutely perfect. I'm I'm so glad to hear you're doing it that way because you're focusing first on the on the teaching and that's really important. But I love how you're doing it. That's a great suggestion. Anybody else? I was, was going to add where we did we did have a faculty position for a year that that was me um, dedicated to just staying up to date with the content and. Uh, offering faculty development. This has been, you know, wonderful, all this whole series. So I've definitely promoted this. But I would say that we're looking at resources as well. So simple resources such as, um, should we consider act, uh, adding like a workbook? So right now there's one workbook that's out. But of course we expect, you know, more will be coming onto the market. So is that kind of a simple way to add these different various uh, item types that are rather difficult to get into exams and our various software. Um, so we're looking at that. We're looking at workbooks because for cost effectiveness, you know, um, some of these products are, you know, going to add a substantial cost if we, if we subscribe to them. So um, we're looking at really cost effective ways. So we're considering adding a workbook. Um, and that would be for the students next fall that would then be using it an entire semester um, in a variety of courses. Um, and then in addition to what you've said, uh, classroom activities, simulation activities, um, and clinical faculty orientation to um, the language around clinical judgment. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing at the University of Maryland as we get closer and closer. Um, I had the opportunity when I was at Curry that when we when the pandemic closed down <laughs> the world, we actually had took that opportunity to really focus on clinical judgment. There's an article I wrote that's um, in Nurse Educator, but we took our entire clinical um, faculty and we sat there and we walked them through the clinical judgment model and talked them how, and taught them that language. So getting them all on the same page, yeah, that's important. Is the book you're referencing Iggy's book? Is that what you're talking about? That yeah. book? Yeah, that's okay. the one book yeah. that we have so yep. far, but okay. um, I'm sure more, more will be coming um, onto the market. And, um, you know, so for us at Maryland, we didn't get, we didn't have any extra time when the world shut down. We actually got crazier. So um, with 900 uh, pre-licensure students that, you know, I'm interacting with. 
So we did um, more carefully integrate one of our um, NCLEX success product that we use. I'm not gonna endorse one over the other, but the one that we use, we one of my big thrusts was integrating that more thoroughly into the curriculums of both of our pre licensure programs. So these software companies are adding next generation NCLEX item types now. So we will be relying on them. Um, we pay lots of money for those products. So um, that's another strategy that we use with a really large program. And then I saw someone typed in about um, making sure you have the peer review teams. And I think that's just that's just so critical. <laughs> You know, and we have a problem with peer review in our profession because, well, I'll tell you why some of our colleagues do is because they are writing their exams at the last minute and they don't have time for a peer review because they're writing it right before they give it. And, and you just can't. You've got to have that peer review. Well, it looks like we are just about out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining me today um, and all the resources uh, that are on the um, Maryland Nursing uh, Workforce Development Center um, website are there available to you and I want to thank them for inviting me to be a speaker I've enjoyed my time with you and wish you all the most success.